Uh, for those of you who have your books with you, I've asked Amin mean, if he'd be kind enough to just mention the page number if he's referring uh, to a quote or reading from a quote so I'll that you can follow it if you, if you wish. Uh, uh, it so happens that this third letter is the longest and uh, uh, in the concluding part especially, it has some of the most momentous uh, statements of Shoghi Effendi. And uh, um, whenever I want to read a passage uh, from it, I will tell you the page number. And I hope that the page numbers in this book are the same one that uh, as the ones that you might have with you. Well, uh, I remember reading or attempting to read these letters for the first time in the uh, summer of uh, 1940 um, at 5 o'clock in the morning. Mr. Ali Nakhjavani had just arrived in Tehran from Beirut and uh, his uh, living quarters were at the end of, uh, we had a kind of an apartment house over a uh, basement and garage at the end of our uh, garden and he and his mother were living there and uh, uh, my father had arranged for us to take English lessons with him and partly, I think, to uh, help me uh, with English and partly in his wisdom trying to get me to uh, be introduced to these more serious aspects of the faith. He uh, had uh, somehow arranged for the fiction of the two of us translating the, these letters into Persian. And uh, he said that, uh, you know, my Persian is not that good, that is his, and uh, so let's sit there together and uh, read these and try and translate them. Well, you can imagine um, for someone who had just started to learn English, how easy going it was to read uh, the English of Shoghi Effendi, but I have never forgotten those wonderful early mornings where uh, the combination of um, real difficulty, you know, sort of sweating it out, together with the um, uh, joy of uh, reading uh, writings of Shoghi Effendi in English, and especially uh, being exposed to the wonderful enthusiasm of Ali Nakhjavani, who at that time wasn't even 20 years old yet, and was a very lively young man. So I remember that that's, I'm telling you this because that was my first exposure to these letters of the world order. And then more seriously, I read them through for the first time when I was a sophomore at college here um, at Stanford, and I remember uh, what a mind-expanding experience it was, really. And um, for uh, uh, me, as for most young people in those days, who were absolutely enamored with all the qualities of uh, Shoghi Effendi, who for us, he was really the perfect um, example, leader, uh, whatever you'd like to call it. It was uh, a joy of uh, mind expansion and hero worship and all of these things put together. I'm telling you this because over the years I've had occasion to go uh, through these letters several times and it would not come as a surprise to you if I say that each time I definitely find things that I had not noticed before. And with this letter that we are going to uh, consider tonight, I'm wondering how I could have missed what hit me between the eyes uh, 
just as I opened it, you notice that each one of these letters has a kind of a uh, salutation at the beginning to the beloved of, the, of God and the handmaidens of merciful throughout the West, you know, there's all of them. And then immediately after that, each one of these letters has an additional uh, salutation, which is not the same at all from one to the other. And guess what it says uh, at the beginning of this letter? Friends and fellow heirs of the grace of Baha'u'llah. And then as I was reading, I came across this word grace two or three other times, maybe more. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me that this particular letter, among other things, is about grace. And anyway, a word which somehow is the center of gravity of this letter happens to be grace. What does grace mean? It's not an easy word to translate. Uh, to my mind, it's a combination of a beautiful gift for which we are grateful. You know, uh, sometimes in a more specific uh, usage of the word, you know, before dinner, Christians say grace. It is essentially a uh, an expression of gratitude for the gifts that are bestowed. But beyond that, in a more general sense also, grace has to do with something beautiful that is bestowed on us for which a normal expected reaction would, should be gratitude, appreciation. And Shoghi Effendi, in this letter, is speaking of the uh, grace of God which is bestowed, refused, the consequences of that refusal and the abiding promise of that grace still. Let me read to you First, from page 169, this reference to grace that I found in here. This is the onrushing winds of the grace of God. He, that is Baha'u'llah in the Surah Al-Haykal, proclaims, have passed over all things, every creature, hath been endowed with all the potentialities it can carry, and yet the peoples of the world have denied this grace. This is really the theme, the drama of this letter. How the gift of God is given freely to humanity and how the humanity at, at large has denied it. And then Shoghi Effendi ends this letter by focusing on the role of Baha'is, as he calls at the beginning of the letter, the fellow heirs to the grace of Baha'u'llah, who in fact are, or at least should be, cognizant and appreciative of this gift and recognize their station, their role in the world as the hope for future of humanity. In uh, page 201 again, this theme of grace comes up. And let me read that to you again. And this is where he's speaking 
about the spread of the faith. And this is already in 1936 when he so proudly speaks of existence of the faith in some 40 countries of the world. Here we are close to 300 uh, now. It says, from Iceland to Tasmania, from Vancouver to China Sea, spreads the radiance and extend the ramifications of this world enfolding system, this many-hued and firmly knit fraternity, infusing into every man and woman it has won to its cause a faith, a hope, and a vigor that a wayward generation has long lost and is powerless to recover. They who preside over the immediate destinies of this troubled world, they who are responsible for its chaotic state, its fears, its doubts, its miseries, will do well in their bewilderment to fix their gaze and ponder in their hearts upon the evidences of this saving grace of the Almighty that lies within their reach, a grace that can ease their burden, resolve their perplexities, and illuminate their path. You notice the theme is the one that's picked up by the Universal House of Justice in their peace uh, message of 1985. In many ways, uh, most of us, when we read that peace message, we immediately uh, were struck by the fact that this was really both in scope, in uh, purpose, and in thematic development, a sequel to these world order letters of Shoghi Effendi. And it's in that peace message where the Universal House of Justice ends up by telling the world, look at the Baha'i communities and see what they are doing as examples of something that is hopeful, something that is promising for future of mankind. Well, this is something uh, that I wanted to share with you as, as the newest, latest uh, novelty uh, that I found uh, in this particular letter. Uh, if you um, allow me, now we can go uh, through a systematic review of this letter. I'm not going to dwell on the uh, portions which are very detailed analysis of the political situation of the world of 1936, but I am going to point out how parallels with those exist in our own time and how sometimes we think that a certain uh, development in the world uh, maybe has a span that is finite, that is repeated, and it comes back and it has larger and larger uh, implications for us. And uh, in this way, none of these analyses are ever uh, dated or uh, uh, invalid. He speaks about the unfoldment of world civilization. Uh, and in it, he um, notes various stages of this unfoldment. Unfoldment, really, in his writings, is almost synonymous to an evolution. That is a kind of uh, page after page uh, of this process that is to end in world civilization. Now, I know that some Baha'is, uh, when they first uh, read these letters, were anticipating that world civilization was around the corner and that uh, uh, soon, you know, said we have gone, as Shoghi Effendi points out in this letter, we have concluded the heroic age of the faith. We are now in the formative uh, age of the faith. And then after that comes the golden age and the world civilization. They thought that, well, uh, since the heroic age only lasted about um, uh, 70 or uh, 80 years, no more, 
uh, that maybe the formative years will not be, well, the formative age will not be much longer than that. And, and so we could look forward to that uh, unfoldment of world civilization. I tell you this, uh, I hope you don't mind if I mix some uh, personal recollections occasionally with the uh, review of, of this letter. I remember on my second um, pilgrimage in December of 1955, uh, Shoghi Effendi, in fact, was speaking a good deal of the time about the, these uh, themes of unfoldment of, of world civilization and the uh, sequence of ages. And there was, among the group of pilgrims, uh, one who felt that he'd waited long enough and he <laughs> wanted to see it uh, right away. And uh, I remember uh, Shoghi Effendi turning around and, and as he was speaking in Persian, I will tell you just the exact words as he used, and then I will translate them. And he said that this is madaniyat ilahist, madaniyat iran nist, madaniyat yunan nist, madaniyat ruman nist, in madaniyat ilahist, hamchen zud entezar nadash de pashin. This is this is divine civilization. It's not Iranian civilization. It's not the Greek civilization. It's not Roman civilization. Don't expect it to be around the corner. It is divine civilization. It will take time. So keep that in mind as uh, we come to the promised part of these letters. This is always something that uh, uh, I think we are privileged to witness a minuscule part of it, but to at least have the certainty, the assurance of the totality of it, even though we ourselves may not be around when that totality is seen. The difference between that and not knowing anything you can imagine. Well, in uh, page 163, uh, when he speaks about this uh, unfolding uh, of world civilization, he says that this dispensation of Baha'u'llah is the final stage in a progressive uh, series of divine revelations, which he makes sure that we all understand that, first of all, Baha'u'llah says that the station of all of these manifestations is the same, but the capacity and the understanding of the people who receive it is not the same. Therefore, there are these variations. But then he makes this very interesting remark here, which again, uh, as you read quickly, may uh, uh, not catch your uh, attention, but uh, uh, at least it caught my attention uh, a lot this time. And that is, it says that the, uh, we are, these successive uh, stages and coming of age of the entire human race, it should be viewed not merely as yet another spiritual revival in the ever-changing fortunes of mankind, not only as a further stage in a chain of progressive revelations, nor even as the culmination of one of a series of recurrent prophetic cycles, but rather as the marking the last and highest stage in the stupendous evolution of man's collective life on this planet. You notice that? 800 years from now, we may be reading this as we may have already started on our interplanetary uh, you know, communications and connections and get an entirely new light on this passage. See, this is uh, uh, what I meant that every time you read it, you uh, see something 
new. And in this same vein, it says the emergence of a world community, the consciousness of world citizenship, the founding of a world civilization and culture, all of which must synchronize with the initial stages in the unfoldment of the golden age of the Baha'i era. And golden age, he explained, is hundreds of years, I mean, thousands of years in the future of Baha'i era, should by their very nature be regarded as far as this planetary life is concerned as the furthermost limits in the organization of human society. So, uh, these references to a kind of time frame which is also related to the expansion of our consciousness of the universe and to our accessibility uh, of other, uh, uh, you know, spaces beyond this planet. I'm, it's not a theme on which I can uh, expound and I hope that we don't speculate too much. Some people I know like to get into uh, all kinds of UFO uh, <laughs> discussions, things like that, and it's a waste of time. But uh, I brought it up because uh, it uh, shows you how, as I said, for example, 800 years from now, we may be reading this with an entirely different understanding. Then it uh, says that the uh, uh, process of integration and uh, the world uh, maturing of, of uh, humanity and the final uh, uh, consummation or the end of the prophetic cycle, uh, which is everything from time immemorial to the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. And uh, then uh, he speaks of the pangs of death and of birth. The death throes are long and repetitive, and we are in a generation. This is a beautiful uh, uh, metaphor that he uses. He says, we are in the generation of the half-light that we dimly uh, see. You see, to us, the generation of the half-light living at a time which may be designated as the period of the incubation of the world commonwealth envisaged by Baha'u'llah has been assigned the task whose high privilege we can never sufficiently appreciate and the arduousness of which we can as yet dimly recognize. I thought this every once in a while when uh, we are groping, we are trying to uh, see our position in the world in a clearer light. Uh, it may come as a comfort to you that uh, we are really the generation of the half light. And uh, the only thing that we are sure of is that the full light will dawn. So then, uh, He uh, speaks of the universal fermentation and the age of transition uh, that we are going through, and then ensues this for middle section of this letter is a long review of the collapse of the old world, case by case. And some of these you may read and you may say, oh my goodness, 1936, Shoghi Effendi is speaking, for example, about the uh, loss of power of the Islamic uh, uh, clergy. And uh, uh, somewhere else he's speaking about we have come, nation building has come to an end and so forth. And you ask yourself, my God, look around how 
powerful the Muslim clergy seem to be, and uh, how many new nations have been born since Shoghi Effendi uh, said that nation building has come to an end. And I think that it's important for us to think about uh, these passages and to see things not through the nearsighted uh, vision uh, that we might have from just seeing the immediate um, you know, the events of the world, but the long-range view that Shoghi Effendi puts before us. For example, when he speaks about the loss of power and potency of Islam, and you look at the world today and you ask yourself, and the word Islam, which has almost become, uh, become synonymous, if not with terrorism, at least with coercive uh, um, behavior, uh, denial of rights of uh, others, and so on, and the whole uh, sp specter of uh, fundamentalism, which at every corner is not a sign of power of Islam, but a sign of abasement, debasing of Islam. Then you realize that a loss of uh, power of caliphate or, or the uh, sultanate in 1920s or the temporary uh, eclipse of the Shi clergy in Iran during the 1930s uh, is nothing in this panorama of abasement of Islam compared to what we see now. And therefore, all of this uh, Sign of you know signs of rage um, and intolerance that are loosed in the world in the name of Islam are further sign of the decline and loss of potency, rather than uh, the opposite. And in the same way, he speaks, for example, of the terrible uh, war that was raging uh, uh, at the time when this letter was written in March of 1936. Uh, Italy had invaded Ethiopia, and it was one of the most um, brutal and really unjust um, events uh, of the time. And you see how many much worse things uh, have happened since and are happening right now. And again, you see, it's not that the uh, um, analysis that he made of the world of the time is dated, but simply further attested, further uh, really proven um, by the uh, events of our time. Then uh, I'm going to uh, skip uh, a lot of these uh, the details of, of the, uh, the long review of the uh, political and, and economic uh, disequilibrium of the time, collapse of Islam, the loss of uh, uh, prestige of Christian institutions and so forth, and get to um, the parts that are really uh, timeless and ring with tremendous power for us now. And that is on page 187 of the book where he speaks of signs of moral downfall. It's not just that the economy uh, was um, at a standstill during the Depression. It's not just that the uh, um, breakdown of the Treaty of Versailles was leading to the outbreak of the Second World War. It's not, all of these things were true, but worse than uh, all of these, he said the signs of the moral downfall. 
And uh, I'd like to um, read a uh, uh, passage here that uh, is really, uh, it gives you a time to well, chant, to stop and think. He says, the recrudescence of religious intolerance, of racial animosity, and of patriotic arrogance. Every one of these things is f true in our own time to the power of 10. Oh, it's much more than that. Recrudescence of religious intolerance, racial animosity, of patriotic arrogance, the increasing evidences of selfishness, of suspicion, of fear, and of fraud. You must have known about Enron and, and, and uh, <laughs> all of those, those things. The spread of terrorism, of lawlessness, of drunkenness and of crime, the unquenchable thirst for and the feverish pursuit after earthly vanities, riches and pleasures, the weakening of family solidarity, the laxity in paternal uh, control, in parental uh, control, the lapse unto luxurious indulgence, the irresponsible attitude towards marriage and the consequence rising tide of divorce, the degeneracy of art and music, the infection of literature and the corruption of the press, the extension of the influence and activities of those prophets of decadence who's, who advocate companionate marriage, who, who preach the philosophy of nudism, who call modesty an intellectual fiction, who refuse to regard the procreation of children as the sacred and primary purpose of marriage, who denounce religion as an opiate of the people, who would, if given free reign, lead back the human race to barbarism, chaos, and ultimate extinction. These appear as the outstanding characteristics of a decadent society, a society that must, that must either be reborn or perish. Then, more specifically, about the breakdown of the political and the economic uh, institutions, he has this to say on page 190. Every system, short of the unification of the human race, has been tried repeatedly tried and been found wanting. Wars again and again have been fought and, co and conferences without number have met and deliberated. Treaties, pacts, and covenants have been painstakingly negotiated, concluded, and revised. Systems of government have been patiently tested, have been continually recast, and superseded. Economic plans of reconstruction have been carefully devised and meticulously executed, and yet crisis has succeeded crisis, and the rapidity with which a perilously unstable world is declining has been correspondingly accelerated. A yawning gulf threatens to involve in one common disaster both the satisfied and dissatisfied nations, democracies and dictatorships, capitalists and wage earners, Europeans and, and Asiatics, Jews and Gentiles, white and colored. 
So, when uh, is painted this gloomy uh, picture long enough, then he raises the specter of hope for us. And I will quote from page 194 when he speaks about the community of the most great name. Who else can be the blissful if not the community of the most great name, whose world embracing, continually consolidating activities constitute the one integrating process in a world whose institutions, secular as well as religious, are for the most part dis dissolving. They indeed are the people of the right whose noble habitation is fixed on the foundation of the world order of Baha'u'llah, the ark of everlasting salvation in this most grievous day of all, of all the kindred of kindreds of the earth, they alone can recognize amidst the welter of tempestuous a of a tempestuous age the hand of the divine redeemer that traces its course and controls its destinies. They alone are aware of the silent growth of that orderly world polity whose fabric they themselves are weaving. This is us, dear friends. He uh, then speaks of uh, faith uh, of Baha'u'llah as being a world religion, not a sect, not a cult. And then uh, he speaks of Baha'i's attitudes toward life. And I'm going to read that uh, for you. It's on page 198. These are, as I say, after all the gloom, then this is the uh, prospects of hope that he has for us. Of such men and women, it may be truly said that to them every foreign land is a fatherland and every fatherland a foreign land. For their citizenship, it must be remembered, is in the kingdom of Baha'u'llah. Though willing to share to the utmost the temporal benefits and the fleeting joys which this earthly life can confer, mind you, we are not uh, ascetics, we are not, uh, uh, you know, uh, hermits, the joys that this early life can confer, though eager to participate in whatever activity that conduces to the richness, the happiness, and peace of that life, they can at no time forget that it constitutes no more than a transient, a very brief stage of their existence, that they who live it are but pilgrims and wayfarers whose goal is the celestial city and whose home the country of never failing joy and brightness. So, then uh, he speaks. Uh, of divine retribution. And uh, before that is one point that he makes, which I like to uh, bring up. I'm not going to read it, but I will uh, simply uh, remind you. you know, so often uh, we talk about the fact that as Baha'is, we do not participate in political partisanship. And uh, Every once in a while, especially when it seems like uh, some very uh, worthy uh, political cause or social movement demands our uh, involvement, 
uh, questions come up as to why is it that we uh, are not uh, politically active. And Shoghi Effendi gives a very plain, a very logical uh, reason for it, which I think you will all appreciate. He says, look, there are Baha'is spread in 40 different countries of the world. This is 1936, you know, now for 40, read 300. And these uh, different countries, they have political systems ranging all the way from democracy to dictatorship, totalitarian, to uh, uh, you know, open and closed societies. And some of them are at uh, loggerheads with one another. Now, if uh, Baha'is were to be involved in the least bit in any political activity in any one of these countries, it would make a mockery uh, of their universality, of their unity throughout these, and it would immediately be the uh, cause of their uh, uh, suppression and persecution in the other countries, which makes perfectly good sense. Then, uh, Uh, he ends uh, this letter with what I think is one of the most beautiful uh, statements of clear expounding in logical, systematic, uh, discursive language the poetic vision of Baha'u'llah for the world order of the future. It's a passage that sometimes was even printed as a separate little pamphlet and distributed called A Pattern for Future Society. Remember, at the beginning of these uh, sessions, I told you that the primary task that Shoghi Effendi assigned to himself was to translate the poetic vision, the prophetic uh, language of Baha'u'llah into the uh, logical language uh, of our time so that social uh, thinkers, philosophers, uh, um, statesmen of our time uh, could understand it. And this uh, statement, which is uh, a uh, really summing up of what the world order of Baha'u'llah uh, means in understandable language of the world of today is, is something, although a little long, but it's the best thing uh, that we could end with. And I'm going to read it. It starts on page 203. The unity of the human race, as envisaged by Baha'u'llah, implies the establishment of a world commonwealth in which all nations, races, creeds, and classes are closely and permanently united, and in which the autonomy of its state members and the personal freedom and initiative of the individuals that compose them are definitely and completely safeguarded. You know, Shoghi Effendi is absolutely the most economical of writers of English language. There isn't a word extra that you could remove without uh, missing the whole meaning. But you see in this compact sentence, how many significant and important uh, facts he has laid before us about the thing, about the kind of future that we expect. First of all, it is to be a world commonwealth in which there are to be no class distinctions no distinctions on the basis of race or nationality or creed, that, uh, and yet one in which the autonomy of its member states, of this super you know, United States, the autonomy of its member states is preserved, and more important than that, the individual, the personal freedom and initiative of its individuals are definitely and completely safeguarded. This very often, you know, people who say, oh, this is some kind of a collective uh, dream that you have and, and, and uh, they, they want to uh, demur, you see that the two 
elements that normally don't uh, coexist are combined in what we are hoping for. This commonwealth must, as far as we can visualize it, consist of a world legislature. Now he goes one by one. World legislature whose members will, as the trustees of the whole of mankind, ultimately control the entire resources of all the component nations. Not just uh, Chevron or Exxon or, or uh, you know, uh, things like that, but this world legislature, which as the representative of the whole human race, will control all the resources of this planet. And, uh, uh, and will enact such laws as shall be required to regulate the life, satisfy the needs, and adjust the relationships of all races and people. So, then a world, led, a world executive backed by an international force will carry out the decisions arrived at and apply the laws enacted by this world legislature and will safeguard the organic unity of the whole commonwealth. Then, a world tribunal will adjudicate and deliver its compulsory uh, and final verdict in all and any disputes that may arise between various elements constituting this universal system. Just look at the problems that we have in the world today, just trying to create semblance of, of some of these institutions. A mechanism of world intercommunication will be devised, embracing the whole planet, freed from national hindrances and restrictions, and functioning with marvelous swiftness and perfect regularity. This he wrote in March of 1936. He, uh, you might say the uh, internet is already uh, with us. Uh, uh, mind you, he doesn't say anything about all the spam and the hackers and the, and the uh, abuse of, of uh, uh, this wonderful instrument that we have. But you can see that we have at least the uh, instrument. A world metropolis will act as the nerve center of a world civilization, the focus towards which the unifying forces of life will converge and from which its energizing influences will radiate. A world that is, you know, a kind of spiritual magnetic center for, for uh, this planet is what uh, is envisaging. A world language will either be invented or chosen from among the existing languages and will be taught in the schools of all the federated nations as an auxiliary to their mother tongue. A world script, a world literature, a uniform and universal system of currency, of weights and measures, will simplify and facilitate intercourse and understanding among the nations and races of mankind. So you see what the Baha'i reaction might be uh, to such a retrograde behavior when even the English who invented the English uh, measuring system have abandoned it for something more uh, uh, sensible and we in this country, the most industrialized and uh, the richest, still uh, don't, and then pay the price every once in a while in such ludicrous things as the mistakes that happen with the calculation of the uh, space uh, <laughs> uh, telescope and things like that. See, this is what I say retrograde uh, behavior. In such a world, in such a world society, 
science and religion, the two most potent forces in human life, will be reconciled, will cooperate, and will harmoniously develop. The press will, under such a system, while giving full scope to the expression of the diversified views and convictions of mankind, cease to be mischievously manipulated by vested interests, whether private or public, and will be liberated from the influences of contending governments and people. The economic resources of the world will be organized, its sources of raw materials will be tapped and fully utilized, its markets will be coordinated and developed, and the distribution of its products will be equitably regulated. Just put this against the prevailing you know, economic uh, thought of our time. National rivalries, hatreds, and intrigues will cease, and racial animosity and prejudice will be replaced by racial amity, understanding, and cooperation. The causes of religious strife will be permanently removed. Economic barriers and restrictions will be completely abolished and the inordinate distinction between classes will be obliterated. Destitution on the one hand and gross accumulation of ownership on the other will disappear. The enormous energy dissipated and wasted on war, whether economic or political, will be consecrated to such ends as will extend the range of human inventions and technical development to the increase of the productivity of mankind, to the extermination of disease, to the extension of scientific research, to the raising of the standard of physical health, to the sharpening and refinement of the human brain, to the exploitation of the unused and unsuspected resources of the planet, to the prolongation of human life, and to the furtherance of any other agency that can stimulate the intellectual, the moral, and spiritual life of the entire human race. This, dear friends, is the future that is promised us. This is a future towards which we are all working. How soon, what parts of it will be with us depend to a good measure to our own involvement in it. We think sometimes that this is the word of God, it's going to happen, whether we uh, do anything about it or not, that is not the case. Good many of these uh, promises are delayed, postponed because of our inaction at the uh, time, and some of them, because we seize the opportunity, we act when we should come about. So, I think the uh, intention of the Universal House of Justice in sending us back to these letters is manifold. One, first of all, to be reacquainted with the beautiful, powerful uh, signs of the guardian that are timeless, that are his writings. That is the institution of the guardianship, which is forever with us. So we are reinvigorated by knowing that we have such a source of power available to us. Then I think that they want us to stop and think about where we are and where we ought to be and what is our relationship to what is happening out in the world. And I think that in that term, the parallels, the dramatic 
force, uh, the from parallels with events of our time and the dramatic force of these letters are just incredible. And uh, most of all, to be energized and uh, to not uh, fall into the self-defeating uh, cycle of saying, well, the problems in the world are so huge, that what can we do about it? There's nothing more uh, debilitating than that feeling of powerlessness. Baha'u'llah has endowed us with power and we should use it. Thank you.